So now I'm going to read uh, Luke chapter 10, 1 through 11. After this, the Lord appointed 72 others and sent them two by two ahead of him to every town and place where he was about to go. He told them, yeah, I can't see too well, so the harvest is plenty, plentiful, but the workers are few. Ask the Lord of the harvest, therefore, to send out workers into his field. Go, I am sending you out like lambs among the wolves. Do not take a purse or bag or sandal. Do not greet anyone on the road. When you enter a house, first say, peace to this house. If a man of peace is there, your peace will rest on him. If not, it will return to you. Stay in that house, eating and drinking whatever they give you, for the worker deserved the wages. Do not move around from house to house. When you enter a town and are welcome, eat what is set before you, heal the sick who are there, and tell them the kingdom of God is near you. But when you enter a town and are not welcome, go into its streets and say, even the dust of your town that sticks to our feet will wipe off against you. Yet be sure of this, the kingdom of God is near you. The word of the Lord. Amen. Thank you. Will you join me in prayer? Heavenly Father, your word says we're two and we're gathered, you're with us. And we just thank you for your presence, asking your Holy Spirit to, to guide our thoughts and guide our actions as we go, Lord, that we would continue to be transformed into the image of your Son, that we could do for your power and grace a mighty work here, here in Wethersfield, Greater Hartford, in Connecticut. We ask all these things that we glorify you, Lord. We thank you. We love you. We praise you in Jesus' name. Amen. So Luke 10, he says, after, after this, the Lord appointed 72 others okay, and sent them out two by two into every town and place where he himself was about to go. And he said to them, the harvest is plentiful but the laborers are few. Therefore, pray earnestly to the Lord of the harvest to send out laborers into the harvest. Go your way. Behold, I am sending you out as lambs in the midst of wolves. Now, originally, this sermon I wanted to preach, and maybe you can relate with me here. I wanted to preach on prayer. I'm not great at praying. I don't know if, if you are as well. Maybe you are, and if you are, please come see me. Wanted to do a great sermon on prayer. I thought, okay, we're taking a break from Jonah. Let's do, uh, let's do a Habits of Grace, um, maybe mini-series that I can kind of collect through the summer. It's praying. Okay, God, not my will, but yours. I, I really, you know, and I've, collect, I've got like three or four books on prayer, pretty good ones, I'm told. Didn't read them. And I'm reading through this, and it's like, okay, yeah, cool. The harvest is plentiful, but the laborers are few. Uh, pray, therefore, earnestly to the Lord that the harvest of the harvest to send out laborers into the harvest field. And I'm like, okay, yeah, so we can learn how to pray really well to send out these people. God had other plans. But I would ask you this. Do you pray to the Lord of the harvest for laborers? Is that something you pray about daily, weekly? Is that on your heart? Do you go your way talking about Jesus and the kingdom of God? Or do you worry about material things in your life? The day-to-day, -day, the chores, the work, the house, the family, the cars, different things? Or do you focus on Jesus in those moments? Last week, Pastor preached a really good ser uh, sermon on idolatry. And so if you didn't hear that, I would encourage you to listen to that. Funny enough, that was a 
pretty big section in what I was about to teach. So I got to condense that section um, fairly well. And maybe just a couple sentences, we'll see. But this morning, I want to start and, and really look at Luke 10 by starting with Paul's words in Colossians 3.15 through 17. So if you have your Bibles, Colossians 3.15 through 17. Paul talks about putting on this new life that we have in Jesus. And in verse 15, he says this, And let the peace of Christ rule in your hearts, to which indeed you were called in one body, and being thankful. Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly, teaching and admonishing one another in all wisdom, singing psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, with thankfulness in your hearts to God. And whatever you do, in word and deed, do everything in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father through him. Now, in this section, he, he highlights what I see as, as four different points to this passage. The, the first being, uh, let the word of Christ dwell in your, in your hearts richly. Know the gospel, and let us know who we are in Jesus. Right? As he sends out the 72, these people already know who they are in Jesus. Let the peace of Christ rule in your hearts. Apply the gospel to your lives. Know the gospel, apply the gospel. Know the gospel, apply the gospel to our lives teaching and admonishing one another in all wisdom. Speak the gospel, both to ourselves and to others. Something Pastor Eric is big on, right? We, we get caught up listening to our thoughts. We never really spend that time speaking the gospel to ourselves and who we truly are in Jesus. Get caught up in the moment. So speak the gospel to ourselves and to others. Spurgeon once said, do try, dear friends, to get so full of the word of Christ in all forms of it that you may, excuse me, that you may be run over with it. You know, it cannot come out of you if it is not first in you. If you do not get the word of Christ into you, you will not be instructive in your general conversations. So having the gospel, the word of God in our minds and then in our hearts and then it coming out of us so beautifully in conversation. And finally, verse 17, and whatever you do in word or deed, do everything in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, giving thanks to God, our Father, through him. Go. Know it in your mind. Apply it in your heart. And go. Apply it to the world around you, to your family, to your friends, to your coworkers, at school. Apply the word. Go. See, the gospel can become such a part of our DNA that we can live it out to the glory of God. So first, we look at knowing the gospel and who we are in Jesus. We're in God's story. Now, I know you see out of your own eyes the camera of whatever your name is, and you're the main character in your story. I'm the main character in mine. However, scripture says that Jesus is truly the main character. See, in the, in the Bible, Genesis 1-1 says, in the beginning, God created. We're part of his story. Yes, we're the main character in our own, but we're part of his story. 
life is tough as we go through as we go through work different trials different joys we see the material world around us but god sees a much bigger picture than what we can see in our little world in john 17 13 through 19 jesus says but now i'm coming to you and these things i speak in the world that they may be that they may have my joy fulfilled in themselves i have given them your word and the word world has hated them because they are not of the world just as i am not of the world i do not ask that you take them out of the world but that you keep them from the evil one they are not of the world just as i am not of the world Sanctify them in the truth. Your word is truth. As you sent me into the world, so have I sent them into the world. And for their sake, I consecrate myself that they, may, that they also may be sanctified in your truth. See, it's almost like um, those that have kids. And the kids don't necessarily understand certain things in life. But mom and dad, they got the bigger picture. They know what's going on. And so God, too, is like that for us, where we think one thing, but God sees that much bigger picture, that we see the things through our camera, and God has the wider lens. And it's so important for us to know the gospel and who we are in Jesus, that identity that we have in Jesus, because it can be our anchor through life. We must identify our identity, and as Pastor spoke about last week, our idols as well. See, because I see it as a, as a coin. There's a flip side to the coin. So we talk about idols, we talk about identity, two sides to the coin. So when you introduce yourself to somebody, how do you in introduce yourself? Is it your work, your status in life? Hey, yeah, hi, um, you know, name's Eric, good to meet you. I um, unclog drains for a living. You know, you do more than like handyman contractor, right? Well, I, you know, I, uh, I'm a husband, I'm a son, I'm an uncle. Well, yeah, but there's more to that. So how do you identify yourself to other people? It's school, it's family, it's work, it's your status. There's so many things in life that can pull us away from our identity in Jesus. John 15 John 15, 1 through 11. John 15 is a chapter I go back to quite often. And in it, he says, should have marked your page. I am the vine, you are the branch. Or I am the vine, the true vine, and my father is the vine dresser. Every branch in me that does not bear fruit, he takes away. And every branch that does bear fruit, he prunes, that it might bear more fruit. Already you are clean because of the word that I have spoken to you. Abide in me, and I in you. As the branch cannot bear fruit by itself unless it abides in the vine, neither can you unless you abide in me, our identity. I am the vine, you are the branches. Whoever abides in me, and I in him, he it is that bears much fruit, for apart from me you can do nothing. If anyone does not abide in me, he is thrown away like a branch and withers, and the branches are gathered, thrown into the fire, and burned. That's intense. If you abide in me and my words abide in you, ask whatever you wish, and it will be done for you. 
By this, my Father is glorified, that you bear much fruit, and so prove to be my disciples. As the Father has loved me, so I love you. Abide in my love. If you keep my commandments, you will abide in my love, just as I have kept my Father's commandments and abided in his love. These things I have spoken to you, that my joy may be in you, and that your joy may be full. That's so encouraging, right? That if we, if we get our identity from Jesus, that we can have that love, that we can have his joy, that we can be full of his joy in any circumstance in our life. And as Rich uh, said this morning in Matthew 16, 24 through 28, he says, then Jesus told the, his disciples this. If anyone comes after me, let him deny himself, take up his cross, and follow me. For whoever would save his life will lose it, but whoever loses his life for my sake will find it. For what will a man profit if he gains the whole world and, and forfeits his life? Or what shall a man give in return for his life? For the Son of Man is going to come with his angels in the glory of his Father, and then he will repay each person according to what he has done. Truly I say to you, there, there are some standing here who will not taste death until they see the Son of Man coming in his kingdom. So we have this shift of our identity from what we do and who we are in this world to identifying with Jesus and what he's done for us and for his people and who we are as children of God. And our place is to take up our cross daily to live for him, to do for him. So knowing the gospel in your head and applying that gospel, the good news, to your heart. Again, as I said, I, I see identity and idolatry as kind of a, a coin and the flip side to the coin. And talked about pastor, did a great job on um, idolatry and, and the need for, because idolatry pulls us away from our identity and our belief in Jesus. John 16 talks about the work of the Holy Spirit, and Jesus talks about the work of the Holy Spirit in our life and the world and the contrast between the two. So we need to identify our idols. And again, if you didn't listen to last week's sermon, go for it. Where, where do you escape in life? If it's a bad day, it's a good day, how do you find escape or peace? See, because I look at it as functional saviors, right? These idols are our functional saviors that keep us from Jesus, the true savior. These functional saviors, they keep us stuck, self-centered, focused on ourselves. Whereas Jesus, the true savior, frees us up to serve others and glorify God. Idols keep us looking towards ourselves. Jesus gives us the freedom to look towards others. What will you do with that freedom? We go back into Luke 10. Towards the end, verse 25, we see the, the parable of the Good Samaritan. It says, and behold, a lawyer stood up to put him to the test. He said, teacher, what shall I do to inherit eternal life? He said to him, what is written in the law? How do you read it? And he answered, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your strength, and with all your mind, and your neighbor as yourself. And he said to him, you have answered correctly. 
do this and you will live. But he said, desiring to justify himself, said to Jesus, and who is my neighbor then? Jesus replied, a man was going down from Jerusalem to Jericho and he fell among robbers who stripped him and beat him and departed, leaving him half dead. Now by chance a priest was going down the road and when he saw him, he passed on the other side. So likewise, a Levite, when he came to the place and saw him, passed on the other side. But a Samaritan, in his journey, came where he was, and when he saw him, he had compassion. He went to him and bound his wounds, pouring on oil and wine. Then he set him on his own animal and brought him to an inn and took care of him. The next day he took away, took out two denarii and gave them to the innkeeper saying, take care of him, and whatever more you spend, I will repay when I come back. Which of these three do you think proved to be a neighbor to the man who fell among the robbers? He said, the one who showed him mercy and Jesus said, you go and do likewise. In that passage, who are you? Who do you identify in that, with in that passage? You the priest, walks on the other side. You the Levite, walks on the other side. You the Samaritan, wow, there's somebody in need. I'm going to care for them. Just like Jesus cared for me in my need. How can you help others and spread the good news in word and in deed? The big question this morning. James 1, says, but be doers of the word and not hearers only, deceiving yourself. Be doers of the word, not just hearers, not just head, not just heart, doers of the word. Matthew 5.16 says in the same way, let your light shine before others so that they may see your good works and give glory to your Father who is in heaven. John 13.35, by this all people will know that you are my disciples if you have love for one another. So as we go, as, as Paul wrote, Whatever you do, in word and deed, do everything in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, giving thanks to God, our Father, through him. As you go throughout your day, throughout your week, throughout your months, throughout your summer. In life, there's a physical need, and then there's the spiritual need. Once we meet the physical need, as Jesus did in Luke 10, 9, then we can ask God to open doors for the spiritual need in these people's lives. And, and that's your family, that's your neighbors, who's my neighbor, well, we just discussed that. That's community, that's new life, that's the greater Hartford area who we're trying to spread the gospel. This past month, we did a tag sale for the underground which was amazing, so many people helping out, so many people praying, so many people, just so much interaction. And we've raised $4,100, and last week I got to talk to Anne-Marie, and she said most of that money is gonna go towards their uh, mentor program. So people coming out of human trafficking and getting uh, the transformation, the, the healing that they need to move forward. And one of the things, interestingly enough, that the elders talked about with local missions is how do we at New Life, how do we engage this, our, our community, the people in the greater Hartford area? What can we do to be a part of that? And the underground was great. $4,100 is no, no joke. That's, that's a lot of money. And that can go to helping with the mentor program, taking people out of 
um, the human trafficking. Emory also said that one of the big things, and as you, if you've been here for a while, you know we used to do the backpacks in the fall time, getting ready for, or the late summer, getting ready for school. And that's, that's great. She said one of the biggest needs for this summer is just cards of encouragement. And if you're interested in that, you could talk to me more about that. I do have information from her about these cards. There's also care kits. So when somebody does get out of human trafficking, they have things, toothbrush, toothpaste, these different things that we kind of take for granted, but they don't have. And one of the things the elders kind of concluded was, we like helping people. We like collecting stuff. And as a, a church body, you know, when I'm going to the grocery store, I can pick up a couple things if I had a list of what the need is. And I can bring it out to Sunday. And then we rally as a church body, and we're able to bless so many people because of that. We see this around the holidays with Hartford City Missions. We collect Christmas presents for kids and for, for families and kids. We give out Thanksgiving dinners for families that are in need. We just heard this morning Michael say about Youth Challenge. Coming out June 17th, being able to feed the guys breakfast, being able to talk to them, and again, initially meeting that physical need, but then begging God to open doors so that spiritually we can talk to him about Jesus, about the gospel, and, and the mighty work that he's done in our lives and can do for them. And that's something we should be praying every day, as we read in Luke. Pray for laborers. And my question to you, something I, near and dear to my heart, and uh, Pastor and I have, have talked about a decent amount, we have apartments right here behind this window. We have apartments over there. How can we, we reach the people, the families that live in those apartments? That apartment's fairly new and high-rise sort of thing and maybe higher end. How about these people? I know that when we had the tag sale, we got a decent crowd from over in these apartments behind us to come over, and they bought some stuff, and they heard the message. That Saturday morning, one of the biggest comments I heard was, I just hope they get to meet Jesus. Like, it's cool that we're selling stuff and raising money, and I hope we raise a lot of money, but I hope most of all, they come to know Jesus. To hear that on Saturday and hear that several other, other times throughout this past month, that's huge. I want to meet their physical need, but, but at the end of the day, I want to meet their spiritual need. I want them to come to know Jesus, to be transformed to the image of Christ, and to be part of the family. So think about that. Pray about that throughout your week. As the worship team comes up for our, our final set here, I want to leave you with this. I know that there was a lot there with identity and prayer, and but pray. Pray for the Lord of the harvest to send out laborers. Be in prayer about the, the position you can have on whatever the church decides to move forward with, the encouragement cards, different things the youth challenge, and for yourself, know the mystery of Christ. Know it in your head, apply it in your heart. Allow God to open your eyes to what he's doing here at New Life, what he's doing through us, in us and through us. And let us help others in word and deed. Whatever you do in word and deed, do everything in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, giving thanks to God the Father through him. Let's finish in prayer. God, thank you for your word. We ask that your Holy Spirit take these words to heart um, and, and 
may, them, may they find a place in our hearts and our minds and continue to direct us and guide us on these local missions and different outreaches that we can do that, that yes, we can meet that physical need by your grace, but that you would open doors that we could speak spiritual things, that they would come to know the mystery of Christ. Lord, we love you, we praise you in Jesus' name. Amen.